We're delighted to see you for <laughs> our latest web chat. Katie, I think we're at critical mass and we're ready to get started. That's wonderful. Um, just a quick reminder that this works best when um, most everyone is muted. So check your mics, make sure you're muted for this uh, while we're in the listening portion. When we get to the um, breakout rooms and Q&A section, we'll queue you all up to unmute and talk lively amongst yourselves. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We really um, appreciate you taking this time, especially after a uh, long weekend, which I know it's hard to come back to the real world after a long weekend. So it's especially nice that you're choosing your evening with to spend your evening with us. We have a few tech tips for everybody. Um, we're recording. Uh, uh, we're recording this whole session. It's already recording. So if you do not want to be visible on the recording, please turn off your video um, and remain muted. There are also live captions. You can turn them on by clicking the closed caption symbol that says live transcript at the bottom of your screen. It's also where you can turn them off. If you don't see that, you can click on more and then you, um, you will have that option. And while we are screen sharing the slides, you can adjust the, the size by sliding um, the sidebar to the right and the left. I think everybody knows that by now, but you never know. We might have the one person on this call who has not yet ever attended a Zoom meeting. This could be their first ever Zoom meeting. All right, next slide. So, oh, I'm actually just realizing I'm just doing all of Joanna's parts. Sorry, Joanna. Um, so we want to just make sure you all know that um, we are able to do this programming uh, free uh, for the whole community because of the support from our members and, don and our donors. So if you're a member, thank you so much for making this possible. If you've attended a few of these and you're thinking about um, being a member or joining, this would be a great time. Um, you can also make a one-time donation, um, but you could do that by CDSS, going to cdss.org. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Next slide. So here's the rundown for tonight. Um, I'm going to do a little, just a short little bit of framing for the conversation, talk about what it is and what it is not. Um, we have um, Jenny Beer, who's a professional mediator, who will be talking to us a little bit about the world in, that she works in. She is also uh, of our dance community, so she really understands what, um, what we're uh, working through right now. We also have stories from the field. We're joined by Dana Duenel Yardley from Montpelier, Vermont, and Sue Songer and Kathy Story from Portland, Oregon. Um, there will be some time for breakout rooms this time. You know, sometimes on web chats we do that, sometimes we don't. People love them, people hate them. This is a web chat where there will be breakout rooms, but it's just 10 minutes and it's very small groups. So hopefully that'll be um, a good experience for everybody. After the breakout rooms, we're gonna all come back together and we're gonna be able to share some questions and, and um, observations coming out of those groups and have more of a relaxed conversation back and forth with, the, um, with our featured guests. Um, and we'll talk you through how to do that. So next slide. So today, I wanna to make sure that everybody's clear on this because I've already had to clarify it a few times. I wanna talk about what this web chat is not. This is not a debate about policy. This is not the definitive answer on any given topic that you have been grappling with. I'm sorry, I wish I could offer that, but that's not what we're offering. Um, this is not an opportunity to air specific grievances. I know that there are a lot of very strong feelings and difficult situations out there, but this is not the time to, um, to draw attention to, to a particular situation that you're working on. You can make friends and buddies and you can do that after the web chat. Um, and it really, I think we say this all the time and you probably get tired of hearing it, but this is not a quick and easy solution to all of, all of our problems. I don't think you expect that at this point, but I think it goes without saying, or I think it's important to say that, oh, that, um, this is just hard and some things are, are hard and some things are worth putting hard work in for. So, um, that's what the web chat is not. What we hope that it is is a discussion about navigating decisions. How do you make decisions and move forward when your team or the team of people that you work with disagree? 
How do you keep your community together when there's conflict? It's really hard. And it's a conversation about being transparent and being proactive in your communication and communicating out with your community. So please uh, join us on that path. And, um, and thank you for helping us stay focused tonight. <laughs> All right, next slide. So why this particular topic or approach? So we got a lot of requests um, from organizers uh, who are dealing with various difficult situations. Um, but this was a common theme that we were hearing, which was, we don't know how to move forward. We don't know how to keep, keep things together when everybody's disagreeing. Um, we thought it would also be good to talk about this as a framework because it, it not only could be applied to current situations, but it also is just good for groups in general, teams of people working together, figuring out how to respectfully disagree and um, really listen and really um, be able to move forward. That's gonna make your group stronger in the future as well. Um, and to, we hope that it will counteract the extremely polarizing impacts of social media. Um, and we'll come back to that a little bit, but I think everybody understands that feeling where you go online and it feels like the whole world is separating into two groups or three, four factions. And um, it, it's, um, we have to work, we have to actively counteract that by being human together um, and learn, remembering that we know how to disagree respectfully um, and, and move forward. So that's, that's what we hope this is going to help us with today. Next slide. Okay. So the other thing I want to say before turning it over to our guests is that CDSS works on this too. We have in the past, we are now still working on this. Our board is, um, create, is comprised of 22, 21, 22, I think, um, members from all across the continent. They come from very different um, dance and song communities, uh, different states, different ways of seeing the world. So this is something that we have to constantly work at, uh, work on at CDSS. Um, and it's come up a lot in our history. Um, do we add song into our, the name and the mission of our organization? Do we let those wild contra dancers in? And do we support contra dancing? You know, this is decades and decades ago, but these were big issues at that time, big divisive issues. Should we support women's Morris teams? <gasps> Should the office leave New York City? What do we think about gender ba balancing? And then most recently, should we become a remote organization? I bring that up because I, I think we're not alone in going through a lot of hard things in the past. And it's important for all of us to remember, we've come across hard things before. We're going to come across hard divisive issues again. It doesn't mean that the dance stops or the singing stops. Um, and so I just, it actually helps me remember, helps me when I remember what we've already worked through. Um, just like you, our most recent conversations at our board meeting were around um, calling terminology at our programs, um, our COVID protocols, and how we relate to our affiliates. What responsibility do we have to them? How, um, how independent do we need to be and let them be? You know, these are really deep conversations, and they're very similar to what you all are talking about. Another big theme is generational transition and transmitting knowledge and handing over leadership. Um, so um, I think we did a really good job this year at our um, annual board meeting. We started by um, having a conversation, introducing all of us to the principles of nonviolent communication. That's a whole realm. Um, I encourage you to just Google search nonviolent communication and check, check out all of the resources that are out there. But basically, it's approaching difficult conversations with curiosity, assuming good intention, acknowledging emotions that are at play. Because a lot of times, if emotions aren't acknowledged, they are really, um, if you can't acknowledge them, you can't process through them and move forward and, and listen to each other. So that's how we kind of started the meeting. 
impacted our business. And the other thing we did was we put, we dedicated time for deeper conversation and understanding. We weren't going to rush through and barrel through and get all the business done. We really held space for some less structured, more open, honest communication. And it really, um, I think what we didn't figure everything out, but it was great. We, um, I think one thing that really I took away from the conversation was a lot of people were surprised that that, that we weren't as divided as, as we thought we were coming into it. We assumed, we assumed so much about other people based on the snippets that we hear either online or in um, overheard conversations. But when we really dig down deep, we all care very deeply about these dance communities. And there's a lot of understanding, even when we don't agree, agree exactly on what to do next, there's a lot of really deep understanding. And that's, that's what's gonna make it possible to move forward and make decisions because you have to make decisions as an organizer. You can't just not make decisions. So I think that's all I wanna say about that. CDSS is in it with you, um, dealing with the same things. I'm really excited to hear uh, from our guests today. I've gotten to know them a little bit in preparation for this web chat. So I think, um, I think you're gonna really enjoy what you hear. And with that, I think I'm ready to turn it over to Jenny. Oh, wait, I have my one nerdy quote. <laughs> big, big Lord of the Rings fan here. So best line in the whole series was when Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf says, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to do, have to decide, is what to do at the time that is given to us. That is one of the most true, beautiful, deep um, quotations that I have ever heard. And I think it's important to leave, keep that in mind. These are the times we live in and we, you know, we were built for this. It's okay. We can get through it. Now I'm really going to turn it over to Jenny. Thanks. It's hard to follow, Katie. It's a very profound thing to say. Um, so maybe I should put my slides up so that I don't have to look at me <laughs> on there. So hold on just a second while I put those up for you. Uh, and we'll set up for slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. Yeah. So I was uh, just paging through who is here. We have the most awesome group of organizers and experienced dance callers and musicians on this call tonight. So it, it feels a little presumptuous to be the person who's talking about this as if the rest of you aren't um, longtime warriors in this area and have risen to that occasion over and over again in many of the issues that Katie reminded us that we have dealt with and at least partially put behind us as we have moved on. So I'm going to just give you a very brief uh, sort of setting uh, setting the stage because we have two groups that are going to tell you about what they've done in their own communities. And I read all their materials this week and they just did awesome things that you are going to want to uh, learn from and copy from. So after they're done, I may add some other things and I have more how to kinds of things that we can get to later if that's um, the kinds of questions that come up. So as Katie reminded us, you know, your community is always going to have hot issues. It's, it's, uh, it's wishful thinking to think that, okay, we're going to solve these and, and there won't be any more. So this is one of the reasons why we don't really want to talk today about masks and vaccines and gender neutral calling and how to deal with those issues, particularly because whatever issue that comes up, the ways that you deal with them, the fundamentals are very similar. And we're hoping that what we learn from this round of our difficult issues will uh, stand us in good stead for the for the next wave that comes. So the first thing I, <laughs> I thought maybe it's facetious, but I think there's a really um, positive aspect to people being in conflict in a community because if they don't really care or if they're really bothered, they'll leave. But these are people who want to engage. They care about the dancing or the singing or the music making that they're doing together. They care about you and each other in the group. And so 
the fact that they're willing to stay and and feel uncomfortable and argue is is a wonderful gift that the people are willing to hang in there and do this with us. That's the most important thing, I think. We find ourselves in an interesting position where this break has given us a time to rethink and redirect. And some people, I think, during the break did more of that. And some dancers were kind of surprised two years later when a lot of new decisions and new ideas suddenly sprung up when they hadn't been involved in those conversations. So I think we're at the moment hearing a little bit of reverberation from the difference between the people who really spent a lot of time thinking and talking and the others who came back and said, wait, what are we talking about? Um, I think we're also going through um, obviously political issues in the country that politicize some of the things we're talking about in ways that we may not have had to deal with before. And I think at least in Philadelphia, we're, we're going through generational transitions and I think that's an overlay on some of the other things that we're having difficulty making decisions about. But I do think we still have that positive for us right now that people remember what it was like when they couldn't dance and they couldn't see each other. And so there's that, that extra um, positive regard or willingness to go a little far farther than they might otherwise because they understand how much it means to them. Uh, Dana may talk about this later because she put it very eloquently in the handout that you're going to get later, but I think it's smart to think about what is the underlying, what are some of the underlying subtexts of the issues that happen to be percolating to the surface with us at the moment. And for me, those are, I should say I'm an anthropologist as well as a mediator, right? So these are anthropology questions. Who do we want to welcome into our community? And, and I would say as an anthropologist, by definition, all communities exclude people as well as include people. Your community isn't everybody on the planet. You, there's a subset of people. They may be people who love to dance or whatever, but whatever decisions you make, include as well as exclude. And that's a, a sad thing, but I think it's also a fact. And then I, I like to, uh, I think for many people, it may just not be the political issues, but we often have significant differences in what is fun? Why do you dance? Why do you play music? What makes a joyful evening for you? And people have very different feelings about how they want to spend their, their precious dance and music time. Let's see if my forward is going to work here. Nope. There we go. Um, yes. So in the work I do, I often focus on three aspects of conflict. Sort of very simply put, the people, the emotions, the individuals who are involved, the problem that you're trying to make a decision about or the set of issues you're trying to make a decision about, and then the process you use together and get there. And by process, I mean, how is your group going to make these decisions? How do you bring people along to a place where they can continue together? Um, one of the things that's interesting to think about is what are you good at? Because I think most of us have a tilt towards one of these sides of the triangle. And when you're facing a deep conflict, thinking about who are my allies in as an organizer in helping the group get through this? Do I have a really strong people person? Do I have someone who's really solid on process? Do I have someone who's really wise about the issues at hand? And see if you can make sure that you have those three bases covered, because it's rare that one person can do all three of those things really well. And I think we mentioned the other thing before. And the last thing I want to say before we get to our stories, um, or do I have, well, we might do two slides. Um, you will have conflicts come up. You will make decisions. You will have more conflicts up. You will make more decisions. And for me, anyway, I think the compass needle points always towards community well being first. That I, as an organizer or as a longtime dancer, am thinking about how do I approach this difficulty in a way that builds relationships while people are working through things? 
that keeps people from sliding into interpersonal dislike. You know, it's really easy if you disagree with somebody to start disliking them. And once you have that happening in your community, um, it causes a lot more um, polarization and escalates things beyond where they need to be. How do you set up conversations that are caring and attentive? Katie spoke to that a bit with the nonviolent communication, which I also highly recommend as a way to think about having really useful uh, listening happening in people's conversations. And then I think this is the organizer's problem, right? The next thing, and that is where you want to be inclusive. You want to be transparent so that people know what's going on and have a say in, in the issues that are happening. You also um, need to set clear boundaries and fair boundaries of what's okay, what's not, what's going to happen, what the time frame is, and respect people's privacy as well as people's desire for knowing everything and knowing about everything. So I don't have good answers to that last one. I think that's always an individual judgment. Um, should I, let's see, I think I'll stop there and we'll go on to our stories. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for some of that framing, Jenny. I appreciate it. Uh, cool. Uh, my name is Dana Duanel Yardley. I'm from Montpelier, Vermont, um, and I serve on the Contradance Organizing Committee there. Um, I've been on that committee since uh, 2010, so that's 13 years, and I still love it, and I'm still there, so that's that's quite a thing. Um, I, uh, I have about 10 minutes to tell you our story, and I'm going to try really hard to do that in 10 minutes. Um, so I want to I'm going to give you a little context about our dance and about the way our organizing committee is set up, because I know organizing committees are set up in a lot of different ways and do things differently. So I want to tell you about us. Um, and then I want to try and tell you a story, a little timeline story about um, how our dance navigated the switch to gender free role terms, um, which was just prior to the pandemic. Um, and I'm going to also try and talk a little about how some of the things we learned in that process has helped inform and um, make our process around COVID policies go smoother than it would have otherwise. Having navigated the one conflict makes you stronger for the second conflict. Um, I want to yeah, see if I can focus a little in that story on some of our conflict points and some of the ways that our consensus process as a committee really helped us through. Um, and then I want to try and leave you with like some things I learned and some things I think we all learned, but um, like just speaking for myself as a committee member. Um, I know there are some other Montpelier committee members on this call and I'm very happy that you're here too. Please feel free uh, and also Montpelier dancers. If you uh, remember things differently or have things to add, put them in the chat. Um, Montpelier people are very happy to tell you what they think and feel about things. So <laughs> right for that. Um, Okay, so here's a little bit about our committee. We have about uh, eight or nine people. Um, it's a committee with a lot of longevity. Uh, like our newest member it has been on the committee for five years. Um, and we have members that have been on for 20 plus years. We're pretty intergenerational. Our committee members are like in their 30s to 70s now. And we're in some more in their 20s when we were doing this um, dance roll process, or roll term process. Um, we operate by consensus and uh, the short version of that what that means for us is we try to get to 100 percent agreement not everybody has to be blazingly enthusiastic but everybody has to be willing to live with the decision which i think is a key point that people get bogged down in consensus they're like everybody has to love it well you don't everybody doesn't have to love it but like nobody has to hate it <laughs> basically um and we'll get into a little more of like what that looked like in practice um, we are a slow moving committee. We like take our time with decisions. We will like bring something up at one meeting. We'll chew on it. We'll take it back up again at the next meeting. We really have a pretty deliberate process. Um, and I think like many dance groups, we are kind of a benevolent oligarchy. Like we're not elected by our members. The members don't like the, or there is no members. We're not elected by the dancers. We like choose ourselves to organize the dance. We make all the decisions. Um, we love our community. We're like making decisions for the benefit of our community. Hopefully they love and trust us. Um, and we're not doing this for money. We're like we're all volunteers. We're doing it because we love dancing. Again, like probably most of you. 
Okay, here is what I want to try to give you the story of how Montpelier went to gender free calling. It is a fairly long story because of the aforementioned deliberative process. So uh, it started in May of 2018, five years ago. Um, one of our really beloved community members, Aaron Marcus, who is part of the Montpelier dance, has been there for a really long time. You may have heard them play music. Um, they're like a contra dance musician. Uh, they're also a transgender person wrote this really lovely letter to our organizing committee saying, here's why I think we should have gender free role terms. And it had all of these personal, like, here's how I feel when I come to the dance. And here's how I feel when I go other places. And here's how this affects other folks in the transgender community. It was this like really personal thought out letter. Um, we said, thank you for the letter. And we put it on our agenda. We couldn't fit it on the June agenda. So we put it on the agenda for the fall. Uh, the community got word that like this issue was on the table and that summer there was a ton of discussion like lots of emails lots of comments people talking to us at dances people writing things on Facebook like lots of buzz about like this is a thing. Um, even though there wasn't any official anything on the table, there was a lot of chatter and buzz and thoughts being shared with us so. Um, we're pretty clear about not making decisions by email as a committee. We really wait to meet in person to talk things out, but we did gather a lot of information and gather a lot of feedback by email. So there was a sort of a gathering process that summer. Um, in October, uh, we met and discussed <coughs> for a little bit. Oh gosh, my dog has opinions. Um, and we tossed some ideas around, but like didn't make any hard decisions. And we agreed to reconvene in a couple months in, in December. Um, along about this time, so of our nine member committee, we had roughly like three people who were like, this is a great idea, we love it. And three people who were like, this is probably an okay idea, but I'm waiting to see. And three people who were like, uh, I'm really not super comfortable with this concept. And the member who was the most kind of opposed and uncomfortable um, couldn't make it to the October meeting and subsequently resigned from the committee before the December meeting, before even engaging in the conversation. Like just the idea of the conversation was too much for this person and they left the committee, which was really hard and sad for us because we're like, we just want to talk to you about it. We just want to understand where you're coming from. But they were just like, nope, can't deal. I'm out. Um, so that was sort of the first conflicty piece. Uh, okay, December meeting, we decide that we're going to hold we're like watching what some other dances are doing. We decide we're going to hold a three dance trial of Larkson Ravens terms um, in March. So three months later or so, and we're going to have a survey for our dancers um, and, you know, do this process. At the same time, we drafted a FAQ document about like, why are we doing this? What are the trials? We printed it out on paper. We made it available online. We made a document of talking points for us as a committee so that when we were having those informal conversations, we would have some consistent messaging coming from all because there was eight of us at that point. So like that's a lot of different voices. Um, and we started publicizing in January for this March trial. This is 2019 at this point. Uh, March, March had a first third and a fifth Saturday. So we got three trial dances in. Um, we had these paper surveys and we did them on paper so that like you could only do the survey if you were physically at the dance. Kind of a pain to collate, but like you just get the opinions of the people physically experiencing the thing, not the opinions of like people sitting behind their computer somewhere else. Um, so we did surveys on how, how did you like that? And we also did a survey at our first April dance back to gents and ladies role terms to be like, how did you like this? We should survey them for that one too. Um, end of April, we meet again, we look at the survey results, the committee or the community is pretty overwhelmingly in favor of making this switch, like 75% want it or are like, I feel like neutral, neutral to positive, like they want it to happen. So we make the decision at the end of April to start moving toward 100% gender free language, but um, like 100% gender free by January 2020, but starting in July, like some dances with some terms, some dances with the other terms. Um, in that decision, we've been talking about this right for like almost a year at this point. Um, we still have one member who's like, ah, like I don't really like this. I'm not that comfortable with it. I might have to leave dancing if this is how it is. Like pretty strong feelings with this committee member. Um, but this person really, uh, 
really trusted the consensus process and I think really understood the consensus process and said like was like said I you know I recognize that the community feels differently than me I recognize sort of where the sea change is going on this and I'm not going to stand in the way of that I'm not going to block consensus but I'm going to abstain I can't I can't in good conscience support this decision um and like I don't know maybe I'm going to leave the committee and maybe I'm going to leave dancing but like but it was just a really magical like recognize that their feelings didn't trump where the community was going like was able to separate those two things out to be like my personal thing is different than what everybody wants and maybe what the group needs so that person stepped aside from that decision and we were all like oh I don't know um the happy ending that I'll tell you that person is still on our committee and like still hangs out and comes to all the dances and is a fun dancer and is still here and like so great that we trusted that process and trusted their no because that allowed them to just hang out with the switch and see how they felt about it um great so we like announce all this to our whole community uh in june we hold a like public listening session community conversation where people can talk about how they feel about the thing uh this was maybe a mistake we maybe should have had that before we made a decision as a committee instead of after we made a decision as a committee but great we had a moment for people to come together in person and talk um and then we implemented the transition we started switching this, again this gradual deliberate like gave people plenty of heads up notice about what was happening, when it was happening. July to December was a mix about like there were 14 dances and 10 of them were Larks and Ravens and four of them were Jensen ladies sort of sprinkled along. Um, we switched in January of 2020. We had two months of really good dancing and then the <laughs> pandemic happened, boom. <laughs> so um, that's basically the story, except the postscript is that when we restarted our dance about a year ago, um, we we restarted with larks and robins instead of larks and ravens. There was more knowledge that came to light that ravens are a special significance for some indigenous tribes um, and probably shouldn't be used as a dance roll term. Robins still has the same syllables in the R. And we just made that decision as a committee. <laughs> we're like, we're not putting this out to our community. We're just deciding they just care that they're dancing post pandemic, like fine, great. Um, and we continue to have a good bit of like information about why we do these things and clarity around that. So whew, that's the story. And that's our timeline. Um, this is going to be in a handout that I made that we'll send to you. And I'll just like give you like this timeline is a story. It's not a recipe. So like you might follow this in your own community, but like maybe it takes you a different amount of months. Maybe you are ready to move at a different speed. I think we really assess like do we feel ready for the next step no we don't feel ready to make a decision now oh we are ready to make this decision here oh we need this time like we really had a good awareness of time i think so yeah just the, the whole process especially that process around trusting the consensus and trusting trusting that just because a committee member said no or said i'm uncomfortable didn't mean we need to stop the process and that really held us well during COVID when we had to make decision after decision about masks and vaccination and policy, like COVID just, the world just changes, changes so fast and you have to keep deciding and deciding. And people would say, I don't love that. I'm, I'm not, but, but I'm not gonna block it. And we'd say, great, we love you anyway. Like, let's keep going. And we weren't really worried about our relationships to each other as committee members, because we'd had a experience of no before that still resulted in us being in relationship. And so that's really helped, I think, in in COVID time as well. And I think our dance community trusts us as a committee because we were so clear and transparent um, about what was going on and when it was going on that they're like, we've also done that with COVID. And I think that transparency of communication has really been appreciated. Um, and there's just yeah there's just a deeper trust that's happened since having like having gone through that process that was a little tricky uh i have some takeaways and am i like super over time i'm not paying attention to any time anymore yeah, dana i think we're gonna give a chance to sue and kathy to come in with their story but we'd love right. to hear some of your takeaways and i think that will come up as we do tell me tell me end. when to do it or like maybe i'll work them in as we go excellent sounds good sue and kathy thanks joanna um, hi, I'm Kathy Story, and with me today is Sue Songer, and we're from Portland, Oregon. Sue is the chair of the board of the Portland Country Dance Community, 
and I'm the immediate past chair of the Contra Committee. And different from what Dana was talking about, we actually are a nonprofit. We're governed by an elected board of directors, and they oversee the various committees that are the groups that actually put on and organize our events, the Contra English and Family Dance Series, as well as our special events. And our events are open to the public, um, although we have a paid membership base, and we have over 200 members. But I would say that at Contra Dances, there is probably at least 100 people that come to our Contra Dances who are not members. We have a lot of members, but we have a lot of non-members who are also coming to our Contra Dances. So our journey is also one about non-gendered calling. And it started back in 2015 when the Contra Committee began talking about this issue. And then in 2019, they decided to hold two dances at which callers would use non-gendered terms. And this was actually before I was even dancing in this dance community. Um, before those dancers, they, uh, an article was written, it was published in our newsletter and our newsletter is called Footnotes. And we have some linked resources. And in those resources, you'll find links to the Footnotes articles that Sue and I will be talking about. So there's an article about non-gendered role terms, kind of explaining what it was, what some of the perceived benefits were, you know, kind of what was happening elsewhere in the country, how was that proceeding, announcing the, that there were going to be two upcoming dances at which non-gendered role terms were used, and asking for community feedback. And then a dancer survey was available at those dancers dances, and it was also available at a ladies and gents dance that occurred uh, near that same time. And it was also available online, asking dancers about their dance experiences with non-gendered terms. And the survey results, again, published in footnotes, showed overwhelmingly, I think like Dana was talking about, that most of our dancers either preferred, strongly preferred non-gendered role terms, or they had no preference. They just wanted to dance. So, And then a separate survey was sent to callers at the time, asking about their preference and also their comfort level, because we weren't really sure how many of our our callers were already, you know, using non-gendered dance terms. And we were, were concerned about that. I mean, you know, you switch to something and then you've got nobody to be there as your caller. And, and you know, we all recognize how important callers are and what a leader they are in our community. Um, and out of that, the overwhelming majority were already comfortable or wanted to become comfortable. They wanted the opportunities where they would have the chance to call non-gendered calling. So based upon those two surveys, the results from them, the Contra Committee in July of 2019 began holding um, one dance per month with non-gendered calling. And our dances are second, fourth, and fifth Saturdays. So basically it was kind of every other Saturday that it was one of our dances, it would be non-gendered calling or gendered calling. And this continued until we shut down. Everything came to a standstill like in everybody else's community. So fast forward two years. So as we were planning our first dance back, um, the committee discussed whether this was the right time to switch to all non-gendered calling. And we had spent a lot of time during shutdown working on a new dance etiquette policy that was based on safety and comfort and inclusion and providing a fun and welcoming community, a lot of energy on that. And we shared that, that new policy in the in our newsletter and also at some summer outdoor events that we had. And we also were really active in developing COVID product protocols that were going to keep our dancers safe. So the change to non-gendered calling for several people on the committee just felt like an extension of that wanting to create that, that safe and inclusive um, environment, kind of an extension of all the work that we had done as a, as a committee uh, during the interview, intervening two years when we were shut down. And I think that um, what Jenny had mentioned about, you know, that our committee had spent two years of intense thinking and talking about these issues and kind of working together that in some ways that might've worked against us because when we came together to think about, you know, are we gonna change to non-gendered calling? We had this real kind of comfort level that we had worked on so much thinking about inclusivity and safety issues. And, I, and in some ways that may have meant that we were not completely in touch with our broader community of dancers, many of whom we had not had a lot of contact with for a very long time. But during our discussion, we considered a dozen different factors 
everything from sustainability of our dancers to what other regional dance organizations were doing to what we saw as the benefits and risks that were involved in this decision. Everyone on the committee agreed that switching to non-gendered role terms was the right thing to do. And everybody agreed that, that it just seemed inevitable. But there were members who thought we should continue at least for a while of what we were doing before shutdown, which was one dance you know, being non-gendered and one dance using gender terms. And there was some other, there was at least one other member who really thought it should be left up to the caller and just let the individual callers decide what they wanted to do. And that eventually they would all turn to non-gendered calling because that's the way everything seemed to be going everywhere. So ultimately we all decided, um, we reached consensus um, that we should hire only callers who would use non-gendered role terms, whether that was Larks or Robins or positional calling. And so now I will turn this over to Sue and she will share with you what happened next. What happened next? Well, when, when I heard Jenny talk, I, I thought, oh, she read us Kathy's of my material because she kind of nailed it. The, um, the people on the committee working, you know, right along, uh, struggling with all these issues, the broader community that had kind of checked out for the interim and that was checking back in. So um, immediately after I assumed the chairmanship of the board of PCDC, um, a letter came to the board um, protesting the decision of the Contra Committee to um, kind of two things, the questioning the process and of, in that meaning not engaging the larger community and, and the use of the non-gendered role terms itself. The, he copied the email to at least 40 people and asked them to reply all. So within a very short order, there were hundreds of emails in my inbox um, with very, um, very passionate opinions on both sides of the issue, um, wanting to come to the next board meeting, which was gonna be like days away. So um, we decided on having a community forum, and that, that's what I'm going to talk about now, not the issues, but just, just how we set this up, um, because it seemed like way too big to um, handle in a board meeting, and there was so much email chatter back and forth now between the 40 people and all the people they forwarded to, and pe all kinds of people were writing to the board. So. Um, we, we rented the space where we usually have our dances and first establish a date that everybody on the PCDC, Portland Country Dance Community Board could attend and the Contra Committee could attend. We found that date first. And then we issued an invitation to attend to all PCDC members. And from, from the get-go, we were really careful about how it was worded and made really clear that this was an opportunity to um, mostly listen to each other and gain a larger understanding of different viewpoints. Um, it was not going to be uh, aimed at decision-making at all. And so there were, there were two goals. Um, anyone who wanted to come was... Uh, asked to please listen and see if they could um, come away with a new perspective or a new idea about the issue at hand. And the, the goal for a community was really to kind of lower the temperature a bit and reach a, a, a better understanding in, in general terms of, of the feelings on both sides, which were, um, I mean, very heartfelt. And as someone said, a lot of this happens because people care so much about, uh, about the event. So the, the passionate uh, opinions and feelings are not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so we, we, it was very structured. Uh, I don't, I, when data said they had a community forum too, I thought, oh, I wonder if it was, uh, they had this much structure. And then I thought, yeah, probably not. So um, we sent a letter of invitation and asked people to um, respond if they wanted to come. And I think 80 people said they wanted to come. Um, I know for sure that 42 people spoke. So we um, we said, if you can't come, you 
can send comments and we will read the comments if we have time and we ended up not having time. So we we made very clear to people what to, what to expect, um, both what, uh, and we, so we set up the room in concentric circles. We had a sound person, um, we had cordless mics. Um, when people came in, if they thought they wanted to speak, they took a number. Uh, and then we called the numbers at random. Every person was given two minutes and we had two big clocks and two timekeepers. We had two mic runners. So the people didn't have to get up and stand up in front of a you know group in rows or anything. They could stand up right where they were. We, we did the random number thing because we knew that friends would sit together. <laughs> And if we passed the mic around, then we would hear, you know, five opinions that were the same. And we, we wanted to mix it up. And so when a person's number was called, they could speak or they could pass. They, if they weren't ready to speak right then. Um, people could, if they changed their mind and thought they wanted to speak, they could come get a number, you know, at another time. And some people passed multiple times uh, until finally there was just a, a tiny, tiny pool. But we, we also gave them um, guidelines about what they could and could not speak about. And I, I've got them here. I will um, read them to you. So yes, uh, please express your own thoughts and opinions about um, non-gendered or gendered role terms. Tell us what you think. Um, uh, you can tell us what you think about the committee's process. Um, you can tell us what direction you would like to see PCDC go. Um, those are all things you can tell us about and all things that other people could listen for. Here are the things you cannot talk about and you will be redirected if you start to talk about any of these things. You cannot talk about something someone else has said. Um, you cannot talk about anything you read in an email. Um, uh, you have to stick to the topic um, and you have to uh, refrain from hostile or accusatory remarks. Those are the gist of it. And we we hardly had to redirect anyone. Kathy might uh, remember, but I there were a couple of people that went over time. There were a couple of people that started veering off into the past. And I think we asked them to, you know, come to the present and please, um, you know, refocus. It was... Um, it was really, well, I'll tell the, the at the end, we asked for um, how many people learned something new? Most hands went up at the end. Um, and how many people would like to talk about something that, you know, they gained from this? And we spent 10 or 15 minutes on that. And I, I would, I would call it kind of a feel good experience. I don't know. What do you think, Kathy? I mean, everyone felt kind of proud of us because we had talked about the, you know, this really tough issue um, with um, goodwill and without, and I would say without, well, I wouldn't say 100% without animosity. There was some veiled underpinnings along the way, but um, pretty, people really did pretty darn well. And so then um, we didn't have time to read the comments that had been mailed in, but um, I asked people there, if they had anything they would like to share as a follow-up, they could email it to me. And then I would email it to all the attendees. So I included all the, um, the pre-comments pre and the, com the follow-up comments, some of which I had to send back to be reworked because they, the, the comments had to stay within these same guidelines. And uh, you know, once you get away from the in-person stuff, people are a little freer to, um, to go off in direction we didn't want. So I, I did one, I didn't allow it all. And some asked to shorten or, you know, please reword this. It's just not in the spirit that we want. Uh, Kathy did a bunch of follow-up with her committee. She can tell you about it in a minute. I'm kind of rushing because I know we're pressed on time. The board had an executive meeting um, to just discuss this topic, um, you know, in a, in a much freer Form to share opinions about the role terms, about the process. We ended that, well, for one thing, it was a done deal. You know, we weren't debating about whether we were going um, back to, it, it, it was done. So as the board, we finished by um, listing the advantages we thought we would gain as a community from using the non-gendered role terms, because here we are, and we got to make, you know, the best of it one way or another. We, it, not um, not a hundred percent success. We lost people. We've still got unhappy people. Kathy just did another survey. Maybe she can tell you about. 
Um, so, but, but the community has um, remained intact. It's thrived. Our dances are well attended um, regardless of this. So we, we've, I feel like we've kind of navigated through um, as, as best we could. So that's so Sue and Kathy, thank you so much. And Dana, thank you for sharing your stories. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but okay. it's I'm, great material. We want to hand things back over to Jenny to really respond to these stories that we've heard and how that feeds into the process of having these conversations, dealing with these difficult topics. Remember that we're not talking tonight about the topics themselves but about the process of having these meetings, having these discussions. After that, we'll go into breakout rooms and then there will be an opportunity for some Q&A. So start thinking about questions you might like to ask all of our presenters. You can pop them into the chat and I'll be keeping track of them. And we will follow up with all of these materials later, including timelines that Dana and Sue and Kathy have shared. So Jenny, I'm gonna turn things back to you. Jenny, I think you need to unmute. Is that visible? Okay, Oops. great. So yeah, we don't have a lot of time. So what I'd like to do actually uh, is first say that um, every dance community has a different set of circumstances. And so some of the things that you've heard from these two really excellent ones might work in your community, others might not. And, and I was asked early on to uh, share another example, which is I just started a new contra dance. And I decided I was going to be the dictator for one year. One year is about up. Um, but I made all the decisions about gender neutral calling, but I also made the decisions about masks and vac vaccinations over the time. And it's been very interesting that I haven't had pushback much I just decided we wanted our group energy to be developing a dance rather than tangled up in these issues that are tangling up a lot of the other dances in our region. So people are having these conversations in other contexts. So I just want to give that as another example of you may have a dictator, you may have a committee that's a friendly oligarchy as Dana does, or you may have a very mature and large community like Sue and Kathy do, where you need to have a lot more process uh, skills to manage the number of people and the number of issues that you're dealing with. So um, I have a whole bunch of slides and what I'd like to do, I'm going to end up, I, I have a handout for you at the end, and um, we can also talk about some of these as we um, converse for the next Q&A and the breakout rooms. But I think I'd like to just show you what's there, what the topics are, and then we can come back and look at things that you'd like to hear more about. So um, when you are having a decision-making process, one of the most important things is people know how this decision is going to be made whether it's the dictator or the long three-year conversation or whatever it is, so that they feel when the uh, outcome comes finally, that they have felt heard um, and that they feel the process was fair. Let's see. Uh, gotta get my cursor in the right place here. I'm happy to talk about the grown zone. I use this with my uh, clients all the time because it sort of makes a more amusing but understandable framework for what you're going through. We can talk about that, more grown zone. One of the key things I do in working with organizations in conflict is thinking about all the ways I, as a leader or a consultant, can help break up or de-emphasize faction forming. This is what really causes the hurt in your communities and the division. It's not the particular issue at hand. It's how people are treated and how they end up clustering in us versus them formats. So we can talk about that too. Um, one of the most important things I think in the situation that we're doing both with uh, gender neutral and with deciding how much risk we're going to ask people to take in terms of vaccination and masks or not knowing how risk can be actually measured is to acknowledge that there's a loss. Whenever you make a big decision, you lose something, you gain something. And I think several people have said this already. I think this is really important for having people who are on the losing end of a conversation or feel they have been on the losing end of decisions to feel like people really understand 
what their losses and what our collective losses are. Uh, and then we could talk if you like. I have a mediation technique I use relentlessly is probably the right word, where I take all people's whininess and complaints and anger and whatever, and I try to always turn it into what positive future are you looking for? And this changes the conversation usually in very helpful ways. And as Sue said, you're going to lose some people because exclusion and, you know, whenever you include some people, you exclude other people. And that's a hard thing. And I, I just think we should acknowledge that there's no like silver bullet that solves all problems and ha makes all people happy. And then I say to myself frequently, as Joanna will testify, it's just a dance. It's just a dance. Nobody is dying here, you know, whatever. And it's fun to be passionate, but it's just a dance. Um, Katie spoke to this, and I, I thought this was important. So I just put a slide together about some of the assumptions people bring to these conversations and making sure you're alert for listening for them in yourself and in others. And then I have some communication tips. Uh, email, and <laughs> the stories we just heard. Conversations over email are deadly. So how how to how to figure that out? Um, people rely on surveys a lot. They have some benefits, but they also have a, a place in the sequence of things. And so that's something else we can talk about. And then I think you've had some great examples today of how to hold effective meetings. And when you see their notes and the detailed guidelines they had for their groups, they're really very thoughtful. So I highly recommend reading what Dana and Sue and Kathy are, are going to post. And uh, my last slide is for you all. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think we're going to stop there. Um, when I was asked to do this, I said, well, you know, I teach this so I could talk for three days and I'm sure you don't want that. So let's go into the uh, breakout rooms, Joanna, and then you can talk about what you saw in the slides, what you heard in the conversations. And if you could sort of collectively think about what are the questions you have about process and handling conflict that you think will be most valuable for the group? So thank you, Jenny. Yeah, so we're, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. I'm going to do that in just a minute. But for those of you who like to take some notes, here is what we'd like you to do. These are going to be small breakout rooms. We hope just three people, maybe two. So what it struck you as you were listening to the stories, as you were listening to the information that Jenny just gave you, and what questions do you have? Because that's what we want to focus on in the Q&A. So I'm going to take a minute and put you into breakout rooms. Please join them and we'll see you back in about 10 minutes. All right, I think everybody is here. Thank you all for coming back from your breakout rooms. This is a moment for Q&A for our presenters. If you came up with a good question in your breakout room and you wanna present it, thanks for typing it into the chat. If you've got another question on your own that was not answered in the chat previous to now, this is a wonderful time to do that. While you're typing in your questions, I wanna turn things back to Dana for a moment just to share the rest of the story and what the outcome was. And I'll stop sharing for a moment and highlight Dana. Thanks. I realize I talked a lot at you about um, like dates and times and not necessarily about what we learned, which is probably the more relevant thing for everyone. So um, the short version of like the outcome is that our dance is vibrant and doing really well in this moment when dances are not doing that well. and. Um, a lot of our long term dancers are still with us, we have a lot of new folks um, and just uh, like the instances of people being teased for dancing the wrong role or being split up to dance with other couples have gone way down and so um, the community is doing great, but I wanted to give you a couple of like uh, sort of like key takeaways and I think Jenny hit on some of them, but I'll give you a few more. Um, one thing I learned is that feelings are not conflict. Feelings are okay, feelings are normal, and just because someone is disagreeing with you doesn't mean it's necessarily conflict. Affirm the heck out of people's feelings and do not let the feelings derail the process. Um, you are also gonna have a lot of feelings yourself as an organizer. When I like um, talked to the rest of my committee that I was doing this, everyone was like, wow, that was a really emotional time. Wow, I wish I had kept a journal. Like, 
Um, so see if you can hold your feelings and the community needs at the same time. Um, the other thing I would say is that like values are so key and like making decisions with your shared values, your shared goals in mind. And you have values and goals, even if you don't have a specific written mission statement, like there are ways that you are together. Um, and just name that out loud. Like, who do you want to be as a community? How do you want to be together? Like, um, make decisions toward that best possible version of yourself um, and like let that guide where you're going. Uh, caring for people in transition. So conflict, this is a place where conflict can happen is that we don't care for each other when change is happening. Change is friggin' hard. Learning new things, really hard. Um, and it's just some people have an easier time of it than others. The more we can be kind and patient with each other and help each other along with compassion when we're learning something new or our dance is going through a change, the more likely like everybody will come along and do it together. So just being aware that transitions need extra love. Um, yeah, and the other thing I guess I would say is that everything is connected. Like contra dancing doesn't exist in a vacuum. Contra dancing exists in this big world in which a lot of political things are happening and a lot of societal struggles are happening. And especially if your conflict is connected to power or privilege or systemic injustice, like that stuff's gonna come into your dance world and people are gonna bring their life experience and their cultural norms into this space and start bouncing them off each other in either good ways or bad ways. Um, and we have a chance in contra dancing to take the cultural norms that work for us and discard the others at the door. So um, like, listen to those experiences, be aware, you know, when we were talking about gender free calling, a lot of uh, older women were like, how are we still talking about gender? I have been a feminist my whole life. Like what the hell? That's real, like contra dancing doesn't exist in a separate place. So the beautiful thing is that we also get to influence the bigger world and the way that we are with each other and dance is like a way that we practice being in the world that we wanna build out there and we get to do it in our beloved dance communities. Those are some of the things, I think Jenny said a lot of the others. I'm, you are all posting a million questions, I'm sure. Thanks for the moment. Thanks, Dana. All right, lots of questions are coming in. Jenny, I think you might be good to lead on this one. This is really just about getting started. We have somebody with a, a dance community in conflict. Where do we start in order to come together again and establish processes for decision-making that work and show care for all? So how does this even start? Such a minor question. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm sorry you're facing that. And it's, that's a really hard question to answer in the abstract because I think each community is gonna have a different way in. But let's say you start with the people side of the triangle and think about the well-being of that group of people who are not happy with each other at the moment. What is a way that you can start creating um, bonds and willingness to listen to each other even if it's on a small scale with some with a few people to start often when i have a large group that has a big conflict i will start working with four or five people sometimes even just two people who are sort of the ringleaders of the conflict and we all know who they are you know the people who are the energy nodes positive or negative and i'll start working with them first and say you know i think if the three of you can really have a series of significant conversations together that we can start bringing the rest of the group into this conversation. Um, but if they still see the three of you on, on opposite sides of the, the universe, it's um, harder to make that happen. So that's what I do often in professional settings. And I find that that works pretty well. Um, and then, I guess to articulate also, yeah, we have decisions to make, they're uncomfortable decisions to make, but first we need to talk about how we're caring for each other and how we're going to make decisions so that people are clear what, what's, their, what's their role. Like, am I just sounding off to the uh, oligarchic committee that runs things and they make a decision? Are we having voting? Are we having community meetings and a consensus? Um, who are the organizers taking input from? So you may, in addition to your members, need to be consulting lawyers, for example, or public health officials, or who knows what else you're, you're asked to be expert in that you aren't 
personally expert in. So I, I think starting to put the structure in place for conversations, difficult conversations, is where I would start. Um, I hesitate to put this out here because I, I think I'd be in a full-time business, but I, I know CDSS does this. I'm also available for some sidebar consultations with people who are trying to figure out where to start a foothold. So um, that might be something I can do privately with some of you. Thanks, Anybody James. else want to jump in there? Our panelists. Well, here's another good question to think about. Um, this is somebody who had the experience of nine different groups sharing one hall and trying to coordinate policies that align for the ease of the dancers. And the question is, what are some ways that groups with potentially very different opinions on various topics can communi communicate effectively to align their decisions? when they would affect dancers who aren't privy to what's going on behind the scenes. So how do groups come together? Well, if you want me to jump in there again briefly, I'd just say these group of people need a coordinating committee where the nine different groups have a small group of people that can start talking with each other about the needs of each of those groups. Uh, there's, there's no way you can do this without a subgroup of decision makers is my guess. And I, I do know of um, organizations like um, FSGW in, in the DC area where they have many different series that share the same hall and they not all their series have the same regulations and guidance. I understand that it does make it less you know easy and clearer for dancers, but it's not the only option that you, um, because they have some nights that have stronger um, COVID precautions and some that, that don't, um, they they feel like they're giving their community chance everybody in their community chances to dance um and um i think that's you know i i they say that's they've said that's manageable so it's something to consider we don't uh, i guess dana earlier said trust the no when someone gave gives a no and says i need space or i'm not ready to jump on board of that i would say trust trust in people to understand um organizers tend to hear from from the passionate folks but there are a lot of really understanding folks out there too that know what how hard your job is right now and what you're going through um so there's there are other options there so we've had a couple of comments and questions about jenny something you mentioned about how email can be deadly so suggestions for transitioning from faction creating email exchanges to more productive discussions. So that's one of the questions that has come up. And then similarly, how do we come back and come together as a community when lots of email communications have happened and some of them were hurtful? How do we welcome back everybody potentially including some of those who sent emails that were not well received. Uh, maybe Sue and Kathy want to talk to this first since they had sort of this massive explosion of email that they then had to deal with. They want to mention that and I can give the tips that are on my slide and other things after that if you want. But one thing that happened spontaneously is that some of the people began arranging private meetings with each other. Hmm. And there, Kathy and I didn't really have a lot to do with that. They, um, there was just enough goodwill sort of baseline in the community that people um, talked to each other and they, they didn't come to agreement with each other, but they did gain a, a better understanding. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't know, what, what, That's good. what do you have to add, Kathy? I mean, any anything that can be in person, it's just so much easier to respect another person when you are face to face with them. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, in fact, the dancer who wrote the first email, I invited him over and we sat and had a cup of tea and talked about it. And it really opened my mind to, I didn't realize how much um, people 
were involved in the dance in terms of their sexuality and gender identity and, and role terms for the traditional role, role, uh, role terms of gents and ladies. And that really helped me understand that so that at the meeting then later, I could hear that and understand that at a deep level. So I do think that individual one-on-one. -on -one. And I, one thing I also want to say was just how great it was to work with, with Sue and Christine Appleberry, who also was involved in setting up the meeting. And I think people in the community knew them really well and trusted that they understood the process and knew most of the people in the community and really valued them. And I think that led to a great success that we had people within our own community who knew a good process that would work. And I'm sure many groups would have that as you mentioned before, Jen. Yeah, and, and what, the more difficult the conflict and the bigger the community, the more having a, a team of people thinking through this, whether that's your executive, your board, or just three or four people who are uh, well-placed in the community to take leadership on it, I think it's really helpful to have people to talk to behind the scenes and say, oh, should I say this? Should we do this? How are we going to do this? Because it's um, it can be touchy. So in the email question, first, the reasons why email conversations are so dangerous. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that people read emails as much more accusatory or hardlined or less nuanced than the intent than the sender actually intended. So they tend to inflame or they have a risk of inflaming people. Um, the second, uh, so obviously they can be forwarded, you get these long angry chains and you have no idea who's getting these. They get forwarded to anybody, but there may be other people in your community who aren't getting them, who are essentially left out in some ways. So it can skew who's talking to who in the, in the community. And thereby increasing the factions as the factions sort of talk to each other and, and air their grievances with each other. So on a one-on-one -on -one basis, when I receive emails like that, or when I'm advising clients, I'll say, you know, be old fashioned, reply and say, thank you for your message. Let's talk. And then pick up your phone or go talk to them in person and just refuse yourself to continue the chain and take it into another forum, another a better uh, way to have a conversation. If you have the situation that they had in Portland where you have large chains already making the rounds, I think you can then move things onto an online space. Uh, I don't know, you'd have to decide whether you want to make that private or not for your community where people can post and comment with guidelines and moderation of those guidelines so that everyone who's interested can see what's being said and can jump in. And I think in those situations, you can also um, help people step back from hurtful posts and, and ad hominem posts, uh, depending on how you set that up. So in a larger setting, I would look for that kind of neutral forum if you can set one up. So those are a few tips. So I think we have time for one more which takes it from the discussion part to the decision making part of the process. There have been some requests in the chat. Oh, you did a survey. Would you share your questions with me? That kind of thing. And it brought up another question from a participant, which is it's important to understand how you're making the decision in this concept of data driven decision making. Are you letting the data inform the decisions or are you letting the data make the decisions? And that data could be statistical data or it could be qualitative data received from surveys. So if any of our presenters have some comments or you know, thoughts about the decision making process and how data feeds into it, I think that would be a great way to close out the conversation. Yeah, I, I'm happy to share the survey that we did in Montpelier. Um, again, it's going to be linked in this uh, very thorough document that I made for you all. Um, surveys, yeah, I think the thing I like, again, our larger community doesn't get to vote on these things so they know that the survey is like a non-binding we're just trying to get the general vibe of the community um and so it's like helpful but it's not 
it's not the be all end all like we are thinking about more things in our decision making as a committee besides like oh the survey said this we should obviously just go ahead and do that um i think one thing we think about sometimes when we're making decisions that uh you know one of our members has really eloquently stated during covid is like what is what is our responsibility to our community as organizers and what is people's personal responsibility to hold themselves which is like a big question in covid safety right like what policies do we need to institute from the top down to keep the group safe and what is people's own thing to carry for their own safety um and so that i think plays into certainly the gender free uh role terms that I, I saw happen I was part of the like civil union debate in Vermont in the early 2000s where legislators were making decisions that their constituents did not agree with and they were doing it because their like larger values said this is important for all the people to be welcome to be included to live up to our values so sometimes you have to make a decision that might not be the majority but it's like the right thing to do or it's the thing that by instituting this top-down thing like gender free role terms it results in a huge boost of inclusion for transgender and non-binary folks that they can't do themselves from the floor with the with the current policies in place right so it's this thinking about like what can people do themselves as dancers and what do we influence from the top and so sometimes so surveys like play into that but that's where it doesn't always the majority doesn't always win if that makes sense mm -hmm. Right. Portland just had a an experience with the survey. This is a COVID protocol survey where the um, where we asked um, we got 545 responses to this one, and we asked people their opinion about relaxing various COVID protocols. And without going into any details, the board actually did not agree with one of the most strongly held opinions of the majority. But we said we can't survey people and ask them, you know, what they think what their preference is and then go against this um, really strong wish for something so we um anyway we in this case went with what the most of our community wanted and then decided not to ask that question again <laughs> All right. Well, we have reached time and there's definitely more to talk about and there are more questions we didn't have time to get to. So thank you all for posing your questions and thanks especially to every one of our panelists today for sharing their experiences and all of their knowledge with us. So thanks to Dana, to Sue, and Kathy and Jenny and to Katie for leading us off today. And thank you all for coming and being here and caring.